Okay, so uh, I think we're live now. Uh, yes. Uh, hi there, everybody. I'm Bowden, and this is Symphony Persona Life. Uh, it's an online talk show where we meet amazing symphonians and hope to learn some cool personal stories, professional insights, get inspiration, and some good nature fun. Uh, we are streaming live from our Lviv office uh, of Symphony Solutions, and today we are talking about what's it like to be a digital nomad. Um, our very special guest today is a true digital nomad, an iGaming expert made in Hong Kong, a cycling and swimming addict, a photographer who captures the beauty of his travels, a vegan food lover who wrote a book and lost it, someone who lives on the island of Gran Canaria with his lovely Dutch wife and a permanently hungry Labrador. Please welcome one and only VP of iGaming at Symphony Solutions, Eduardo Remedy. It's good to see you, sir. Hey there, nice to see you. Good afternoon. Hope you're doing well. Oh yes, of course. I've been I've been waiting. I've been waiting for this talk for so long. Honestly, good. you're wearing a T-shirt that would that that would do well in Grand Canaria. It's perfect. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, well, am I invited uh, already? Yeah, I'm absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big tourist destination, obviously. So, yeah, you're welcome. I'm sure you, if you enjoy um, uh, Spanish food and, you know, a little bit of sunshine, then, yeah, and I think you'll enjoy it for sure. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so uh, let's just find out if uh, our audience can hear us well, if they can see us well. Please let us know down in comments where you are watching us from in the country uh, uh, or your, your, your city or wherever you are now. Let us know, okay? Uh, I can see Mona uh, joined us. Uh, Mona, good to see you with us. Yes. Uh, so um, on this show, have you, have you ever watched the uh, Symphony of Persona Live? I did. I watched, I think, the very first one when Valentina was uh, was on it. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> so uh, on this talk show, we are trying to find out something new about you and your amazing personality we're trying to learn uh an amazing life story of uh, each of our guests but we want for uh, our guests to also uh, have a good time and uh, find out something new about themselves <laughs> and to start off we always play this game called never have i ever have you heard of this one yeah yeah i remember i remember valentina's one so yeah go for it i'm ready okay so uh, uh, it's this simple, you just uh, raise your right or left hand up, spread your fingers like that, okay? Uh, yeah. Bring the, the arm closer to the camera so we can see it, yes. And I will be stating uh, uh, some statements. Uh, if you have uh, done it, then you just uh, put one finger down, down. okay? Yeah. That is clear, okay. So this first one goes, never have I ever Googled my own name. <laughs> what did you find there? Oh, I think my blog came up actually. Okay. <laughs> any, any any exciting facts? Uh, well, you can go and have a look at my blog. It's um, it's called Eduardo's Road to Fitness. So there oh, you go. I, okay, we'll do right. Yeah. Uh, never have I ever cut my own hair. Ooh, have I ever done that? I don't think I've cut my own hair, no. My sister cut my hair, but no, I haven't. That works as well. Uh, never have I ever joined an online meeting wearing pajama bottoms and a professional top. Never. I don't wear pajama bottoms. They can use your magic. <laughs> okay. What was the weirdest thing you ever did while online meeting? No. Um, actually, the weirdest online meeting was one where I saw a customer... I won't say which one. Uh, they joined the meeting without wearing a shirt. And myself and one of my colleagues, um, it, I think it's one of those things that you never want to see and you never, you never want it. It's burnt into the back of my mind. So thank goodness it wasn't me that was doing that, but no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so here's the next one. Uh, never have I ever lied about my income. Lied about my income? No, I don't think so. Never have I yeah, ever I've avoided uh, subjects, but never lied about it. <laughs> well, uh, never have I ever been arrested. Oh, I've been arrested by the People's Liberation Army in China. Yeah. Whoa. 
Well, yeah. how, 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 how did you get away? <laughs> oh, that's a long story. You want to hear it? I guess you want to hear it. So I, I, I was living in Hong Kong um, and I'd had a huge argument with my girlfriend at the time. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go camping. And I'd seen this really cool beach around the, the coast, up the coast from Hong Kong in mainland China. Uh, when I was flying in on a flight, I saw all these lovely waves coming in. I thought, that's got to be a good surf beach. So I thought, why not just go there? So I left in a big hurry. I, I grabbed my tent, um, threw a few things in it. I grabbed my mountain bike, rode down the hill from my girlfriend's house, went to the train station and realized it was a public holiday. And on public holidays, they didn't let bikes go on there. So I was like, damn. So I rode back up there, pretending to still be angry, left my bike, said, I'll just run. I'll run up the coast and just get a bus or whatever. So I jumped on the train, went across the border. The train station was incredibly packed. So I thought, I'll just jog out of town. This is Shenzhen, which is kind of like the border town uh, when you're in mainland China. So I just started running down the road. I was pretty fit at the time. So going for a couple of hours run was OK. So I was running and I came across a, a tunnel which was not lit. But I could see to the right hand side, there was the old road. Yeah, with like grass growing out of the middle. I thought I'll take the old road and probably it's going to come out on the other side of the tunnel, which it did. And that happened a few times. I saw a few of these tunnels. And then one time that road just kept going and it, it wasn't coming out on the other side of a tunnel. What happened is I went over a small hill and discovered a huge army camp there. And I was like, oh, that's not good. I'm not meant to be there. And as soon as I saw it, these two guys came out of the bushes with uh, AK-47s and bayonets and arrested me for trespassing on military ground. No way. Yeah, it was quite hectic. And they, they basically then interrogated me um, for about four hours. Um, yeah. The, the, was, did she know about it? <laughs> about well, the risk that funny, you took? The funny story was, right, so um, they were pretty abusive, actually, at this thing. Like, like they were, they asked me if I wanted to do some martial arts and fighting with their top guy. And I was like, no, no, I don't want to do that. But if you've got a guitar, I'll play a guitar for you. So I kind of deflected it. And they gave me this ancient guitar that didn't really work. Um, couldn't really play it. The strings were all rusted up. And um, to cut a long story short, they came with a piece of paper and they wanted me to just sign my name of it on the bottom. So I was like, what is this? I don't know what this is. This could be you know, anything. So I just signed anything. like John Wayne, you know, and then they took it away and they drove me out of this camp and they drove me not to the, the, the border crossing, but they drove me inland to an abattoir um, where they were killing pigs and just dropped me off at the abattoir as some sort of message. And I then ended up walking for like 5k on this, this road. And I remember it was covered in grease and um, stuff from from the pigs they've been dripping as they took them away in these big trucks it's horrible place and I got to the end of the road and then this uh, beautiful yellow air-conditioned city bus which goes to Hong Kong to the border was there so I just waved him down and jumped in the bus and that guy just took me through the border it took me all the way to central to to a place called Lang Kwai Fong which is like a big party bar area and by that time I'm starving hunger I hadn't eaten anything and I, I saw this um, this diner, it's called Al's Diner, and they had amazing meatloaf. And I thought, that's what I want. So I went into the bar and I found my girlfriend in there with her friends. <laughs> so I was like, oh, and, hey, nice to see you here. So it was pretty I, ironic that after all of this, you know. And I, I, I'm, I'm assuming your, your, your boots must have been covered with mud and everything. <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't mud. It was yeah. just at that time, the kind of greasy stuff had, had worn off. But I'd had like a horrendous day. And then had come out the other end of it and gone to this diner where I was going to reward myself. And then there she was. So, yeah, it was pretty funny event. Okay. I remember how we got onto that. But, yeah, that was how I got arrested by the People's Liberation Army. I think I was on four, by the way. Uh, oh, it was two down. We had two okay. down. Okay. Three then. All right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So here's the next one. Uh, never have I ever worked with someone I couldn't stand. Oh, I have many times. Let's do it with two. Not, not, not at Symphony. Like, you just have to deal oh, with it. Well, wait a minute. Not at Symphony Solutions, though, right? Not at Symphony. No, we're perfect. There you go. <laughs> we are. Uh, never have I ever tried to learn a challenging skill from a YouTube tutorial and failed. Hmm. Failure is not an option. Uh, I use YouTube a lot. 
um, failed. Yeah, I've tried a few recipes that didn't work out. I wouldn't say that's really uh, I don't know. Failure. Oh yeah, I've done quite a few recipes that are horrendous. Okay, yeah. who who who's your uh, favorite? Who's your crush on YouTube? Out of mm -hmm. all the chefs that uh, uh, that cook, um, I I watch one during lockdown. It seems a long time ago now, but I used to watch this guy called Brody Moss, and he was basically living on a boat, fishing, traveling around um, remote parts of Australia. So yeah, I, I I would say he's the one that springs to mind. No, okay. Yeah, he he had this show. It's called Young Bloods or something like that. All right, I'm I'm a big fan of Gordon Ramsay, and he's the Great Escape. I love okay. it. I'm not okay, that. so there's one down, right? Yeah, maybe. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Never have I ever pretended to know how to dance. And uh, no, I've never pretended. I just I'm not. I was never that great at dancing, so pretending wasn't an option. Okay. Never have I ever fallen in love for the first sight at the first sight. Ooh, that's a good one. I would say I probably did. That's with my current wife. What else did I say there, Bodan? You put Congratulations on, on a beautiful wife. Probably watching this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she is. I, I, I hope she is. Yeah. Oh, oh well, uh, well you, you, said, you didn't say that on purpose. Uh, it, it's just the way oh, it happened. True. Absolutely true, yeah. Okay. Thanks for your honesty. I have another bunch of quick questions. Very quickly, uh, just uh, uh, I, I want you to answer the question as soon as the question is being asked, like immediately. So. Just give us whatever pops in your head. Uh, okay. This first one is, what's the weirdest thing you ever did to make money? The weirdest thing? Ah, I can remember the weirdest thing that I tried to do that wasn't successful. That was painting toy soldiers. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't pass the interview, but um, that was the weirdest opportunity. Um, yeah, probably that one. I did I did a bit of uh, lifeguard duties for a while, teaching kids to swim. It wasn't really weird, though. And, but yeah, probably a toy soldier one. That was probably the most unusual. I was with a friend in Hong Kong. We were running out of money um, to, to buy beer. And we thought, what can we do? And we saw an advertisement for painting toy soldiers. And I thought, how hard can that be, right? So we went upstairs. The lady put these um, lead toy soldiers um, and gave us a very fine brush and said, here you go, you copy this one. They gave us this, book, this one to copy, and it was the most intricate thing you've ever seen, Bodan. And instantly I knew we were screwed. There was no way in the world we were going to recreate that. And But we tried, of course, we tried. And as we started going through it, I said to my buddy, I said, oops, you know, did you see the strap on the helmet there? Or, no, didn't see that. <laughs> and then by the time we finished, it looked like a Lego, you know, it was horrendous. So okay. That was a weird um, almost job. Let's call it that. Were you were you were you really uh, 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 like uh, ready to spend that money on booze? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was. I was only about nineteen. Yeah. Okay, here's yeah. the next quick question. What's the most rebellious thing you did as a teenager? Ooh, rebellious. Um, probably. Mm, pierce my own earring make my own earring and drink homebrew something like that actually at the same time the earring oh. came because of the homebrew thank god you survived yeah both. <laughs> yeah it was really embarrassing because you know in those days you, at school we weren't allowed to wear earrings and so the guys would put a small you know band-aid here on the on on the on the over the ear while you're in the school everyone knew you had an earring if you had a band-aid there that was kind of rebellious and um, because we were so wasted at the time we'd put the earring in the wrong place <laughs> and uh, yeah it looked terrible so yeah that that was a that was a fail that was pretty rebellious i guess here's the next one uh name something that you are obsessed with right now obsessed with oh I've always been obsessed with cycling so probably still that I mean sport in general but cycling and swimming those two yeah and, and I guess my wife would say like my diet so I'm, I'm pretty obsessive about what I eat um, okay so yeah it kind of goes together I suppose very nice thank you uh there's one more if you had an unlimited supply of one thing what would that be time I agree. <laughs> and here's the last one. What do you want for birthday? My birthday? Um, 
I guess I'd like to just, and it sounds a bit cliche, but I just like to be healthy and happy with what I do. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Right now I've got yeah. a toothache, so I'm biased. I'm kind of thinking <laughs> I wish I didn't have a toothache. <laughs> Anything physical so we can get prepared? Um, no, then I'm definitely not going to get any earrings or anything like that done. Um, I've got no, my own no, really nice no coffee. More, no more piercing, yeah? No, definitely not. Coffee mm -hmm. machine is something I might treat myself to, actually. Noted. Yeah. I'll copy that. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're moving on to the big questions. That's the way we call them. And uh, we'd love to hear about your journey uh, into the iGaming industry first. Uh, uh, but <laughs> there's this question I cannot not ask. Uh, do you ever try to gamble or did you ever try your uh, luck? Only, only when I was testing applications. So if I was doing some research on the gambling apps that other competitors had, because I used to work for the operator side. So then I would create an account and just test them. But I learned pretty early on um, that uh, I couldn't afford to gamble, really. It was one of those things I, I could, you know, you can spend quite a lot of money gambling and I mm -hmm. prioritize that. So I, it's entertainment, really. And I just decided that I'd rather spend my money on other things as opposed to gambling. So no, I wouldn't describe myself as a as a gambler in that sense. I gamble on, on other things, um, but not in terms of um, you know traditional gambling apps and and, and things like that. No. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, please share this. Uh, uh, I, I hope it is, and I know it is uh, the the exciting story about how you got into the thrilling world of iGaming. Oh, it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting one. So. I think maybe to make to, to give it some context, I'll I'll speak about what I was doing before I came into iGaming. So years before I came into the industry, I had my own software development company working with some like-minded souls. And back then, what we were do, doing was building small mini games. Um, in those days, I don't know if you remember, but games used to be shared via a link via email. They're really simple and you might play, you know, soccer where you have to shoot a goal and try and beat the goalie. And what we were doing was reskinning these games and selling them to marketing uh, departments within uh, a company. So we might make one for, say, Heineken and we would brand it Heineken and then it would become like a viral game. So we were doing that. We had um, some really good game developers back then. Then there was a uh, financial crisis. And the marketing budgets all dried up. Um, typically, those are the ones that get hit. And we had some really good developers. And I was thinking, what can I do? Where, where is there still money? And so I figured the areas where there would still be budget was where companies had to be compliant in something. Um, because they have to be, right? So I figured they must always have a budget. So then I thought, well, what companies have large compliance budgets? And the pharmaceutical sector was one of them. So I had a friend that worked there. We went to have a meeting. I chatted with him and said, how do you kind of manage your compliance? How do you know whether you're compliant right now in terms of drug R&D? And this guy who was super intelligent, he showed me all these crazy Excel spreadsheets and tried to show me how they monitored whether or not they were compliant. And I thought, that's pretty difficult to see, right? I said, how about if we built you a nice dashboard, something that was really easy and visual, where you could just see at a glance if you were compliant or not in one of these areas and he said yeah yeah maybe we can do like a proof of concept and so we did so i used those game developers who are really good at building interfaces um, to build digital dashboards for this pharmaceutical company and that was going really well so we were just doing those uh, you know churning them out for different brands within the pharmaceutical companies um eventually i uh, kind of sold my stake in that company walked away from it and um, moved to Barcelona. And my wife at the time was a personal trainer and she was training this guy who she said was into IT, doing something with gambling, but not quite sure what. And she was telling him that, you know, her husband was into tech and blah, blah, blah. And he said, come over. So I went over to his house and I remember going there and it was this enormous apartment in, in Barcelona. The door was kind of open and I was just walking through this massive house thinking, geez, where is this guy? And I found him sitting there with a couple of screens. Um, and I sat down with him. He was even more intelligent than the guy in the pharmaceutical business. 
And he was showing me his software platform and how he managed risk. And I said, geez, man, it'd be great if you had some sort of digital dashboard to visualize <laughs> all this. And he went, okay, yeah. And we had a, a good chat about that. And, and we left. I went home and and my wife said to me the next day, oh, this guy's giving you a job. And I said, don't be ridiculous. That wasn't an interview, man. That was, we were just chatting. And he said, she said, no, no, I think he's offering you a job. So we had kind of an argument about it. And I said, okay, look, I'm just going to call the guy. So I called him up and said, hey, listen, I'm a bit embarrassed here. My wife thinks that you're offering me a job. And he goes, oh, I am. When can you fly to Germany? And I was like, holy crap. Uh, okay, you won the bet. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, wait, 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 hang on a second. You know, what's the salary like? What am I doing? And he came out with a number. I was like, okay, I'm buying my ticket. And I went to Germany. And that's kind of how I fell down the rabbit hole, if you like, into gaming. Um, and it was working on a an, um, an agent platform for a company called Pinnacle Sports, actually, back in, this would have been mm, like 2007, 2008, so a long time ago. Um, and that's kind of how it started, really. So I started out working as a, as a product owner. Um, actually, I tell a lie. I started out first learning how the business works, so trading and pricing sports and events. And then we move from that aspect of the business into uh, product. So, yeah, that's in a nutshell how it started. And then from then, I just started moving around the industry. So I spent quite a bit of time in, in Curacao, which is where they were based. Um, and I was actually then working. The, the term wasn't really around digital nomad, but I was actually doing that. So I was based remote in Barcelona. My stakeholders were in Asia and the development team were in Curacao. So I was right in the middle of the time zone. I was like 12 hours or so behind, um, or eight hours, whatever it was from Asia and around the same to Curacao. So, yeah. Do you think this is something you would want to stick to for the rest of your life? I mean, this particular I industry. Have no idea. I've, I've always been a bit of a closet geek, right? So I've enjoyed the intersection of technology and product and being kind of at that. Um, and when I was a lot younger, I was interested in programming. So I was, um, when I was still at school, they started a computer club. This was like, we're talking like ancient history here when computers had like 16K of memory and, and, um, and a tape drive. But I found that really interesting. So I started out learning basic, then I, I got books on COBOL, Fortran 77, even Algol 66, which if you Google, is one of the first kind of AI languages. Um, but I pretty rapidly realized I just didn't have the, the maths really to be a star in that field. I was OK, but I was much more interested in the business side and how could I leverage technology to solve business problems and then fell into product, which seemed like a pretty good area to be. Right? So you're kind of at the intersection of, of business and technology. But to answer your question, did I think that is where I was going to be uh, all those years ago? Really, I had no idea, but it was super interesting. Um, the train kind of left the station and I was on it. So I just kept going, really. Mm. Do, you yeah. want, do you think you, you're going to stick to, to this particular industry? I uh, think for so, the, yeah. For the, for the rest of your professional career, at least. Yeah, I think so. I, I don't see myself. Uh, it's, it's moving even faster now, you know, with AI and all the things that are going on there. So I think that the way that people interact with technology is already changing right it's it's changing so quickly so for me it's really interesting moment to be in the industry i think we're going to see uh, some tremendous changes in the next uh, months actually months and years it's gone even faster so no yeah trains got more exciting so i'm i'm just uh moving into another carriage on the train let's use that euphemism i suppose okay thanks uh, uh here's a question from mr cannabis by the way being <laughs> It says being made in Hong Kong. Yeah. Did you, did you come equipped with extra technological powers? <laughs> I yeah. mean, I think. Yeah. I think, well, maybe I wasn't. I was. Uh, I was never afraid of technology. I always embraced it. I enjoyed it actually. So, Hong Kong, when I grew up, was. Um, kind of built on the backbone of being an entrepreneur, I would say. That, that's kind of part of the culture of being in Hong Kong. Um, it was very fast-paced. Things were always changing. Whenever there was an emerging tech, it seemed to be that Asia picked it up first, whether it was mobile phones like 
Um, I remember having had a phone for quite a few years and then coming to London and seeing very few of them around. Um, so, yeah, I suppose if that answers his, his or hers, I'm not sure the, the, the gender of Mr. and Mrs. Cannabis, but um, I wouldn't say superpowers, but just kind of a, um, an acceptance and, and being able to embrace emerging technologies. That's probably something that I picked up from living in Hong Kong, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, the, the fact that you were born and or raised uh, or you grew up in, in Hong Kong, how did that in influence, uh, how did that multicultural background influence you being a digital nomad? Did I, it help? Yeah, tremendously, I would say. Um, so I was a minority in Hong Kong for a start, um, but then there were many others with me. So the school that I went to was built, um, it was in a British colonial school, um, but it was a real melting pot. In, in those days in Hong Kong, there were a lot of what we called expatriates. So these were Europeans, or let's call them Westerners, that were, in a way, they were more like analog nomads, right? So they were engineers. Um, they were people that, uh, there were school teachers, actually, people that had left their own home countries to go somewhere exciting and exotic. So I was kind of surrounded by people with that mindset. All of my teachers were born and raised in the UK, but decided they didn't want to stay in a cold, wet, rainy uh, UK. They wanted to go to Asia and be in Hong Kong and, and then use it as a stepping stone to travel around Southeast Asia. So I think having those people around me definitely helped. And I suppose just being in Asia um, and having a place where you could go quite quickly and quite easily to Thailand or Indonesia, uh, across the border into mainland China, probably sowed the seeds for uh, then becoming what we call now a digital nomad, yeah. Probably so, yeah. Um, so this uh, next question uh, is quite big as well, but we know that you are a, it says cycling and swimming addict, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, whichever way you call it, can you share the most memorable adventure of your active explorations would you yeah um let's see on a bike probably in mainland china i would say um china back then this would have been like the mid 80s um not all or a vast majority of the country was not open to tourism so there were areas that were not on the map areas where westerners were simply not meant to be but as a as an adventurous sort of 17, 18 year old, I'd kind of ignored that and thought, wherever I got my bike, I'm just going to go. And um, a couple of friends of mine, I was working part time in a cycle shop because I was also racing uh, on the bike on the weekends. They came in and said, hey, check this out. And it was a Lonely Planets guidebook of Southeast Asia. And it described a road in Sichuan province that basically connected Sichuan with what used to be Tibet and now was China but also with what then was Tibet. Basically, China kind of moved the borders a bit. Um, but it was described the road as one of the most dangerous, spectacular, outrageous roads in the world. And I was like, well, we have to go cycle that one then, right? So um, it involved about six days of climbing um, and uh, about a third of the way up one of these mountain passes, we stopped to eat some sweets. We had these sweets called white rabbit and um, you find them everywhere in mainland China. They're kind of wrapped in rice paper and they're pretty funky because you can eat the wrapper. So anyway, we were sitting there eating these uh, white rabbits and these two guys just suddenly appeared and started telling us to leave. And we we're like, well, what's your beef, man? We're sitting here and not bothering anybody in the middle of nowhere. And eventually they showed us this little thing. And I was like, what is that? And we're like, oh, it's a fuse. Then they were going boom, boom, making all these sounds. Like, ah, oh, ooh, okay, we better go. They're going to explode something. So we started cycling back up the hill, and they didn't look real happy with us going up the hill, but they followed us. And we went around the corner, and there was this huge explosion back around the corner where we just come from. Turned out they were blowing up these enormous boulders, and the boulders fall down into the road and block them. And these poor guys, they get dropped off early in the morning with a packed lunch some fuses and a whole load of dynamite. And their job is to blow up big boulders, right? So roll forward like two weeks and I'm coming back now by myself. My, my two friends that were with me had a longer vacation. They were continuing on. 
and I was riding back to Hong Kong, well, to Chengdu, actually. So I'm riding down the same climb. I left at five in the morning and I'd already been riding downhill for about four hours. It, it's pretty high, right? And as I come around the corner, I see two guys sprinting down the hill, like two switchbacks below me. And I'm like, holy crap, that's not a good sign. Yeah, <laughs> only they run downhill, obviously, because it's much quicker if, they, if they've set a charge. So I started sprinting after them. Meanwhile, looking to see where was the boulder that they were blowing up. <laughs> and I, I caught up with them. They're still running and I'm bouncing on my mountain bike looking next to them. And then this huge explosion goes off back there. So, yeah, for them, for the next three hours, I was paranoid. I was riding and constantly looking to see any guys sprinting. Uh, <laughs> that's probably the weirdest one. That's the one that come, comes to mind when you ask the question. It was, it was an awesome trip, but, yeah, the boulder demolition is <laughs> a little hectic. Oh my God! Uh, where did the passion for 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 cycling actually come from? Uh, why why was it cycling? Why was it not I think it's, like running I think or it's a sense of freedom that I get on the bike? Right. So, it, you know, when I was a young kid, I was in Hong Kong. Yeah, you could jump on a bus and you could get a cab, or or you could just plain walk. Um, but for me, those were kind of yeah, a bit boring, really. If I had if I had a BMX at those days and I could get on the BMX and I could just go explore the neighborhood. Yeah. So it's, it came from exploring on my bike. It was free. Yeah. Um, it was completely flexible. If I wanted to turn left, I turn left. If I wanted to go right, you turn right. And obviously there is a kind of a sense of fun when you're zooming down a hill when you're, you know, 10 or 11 years old. So I kind of connected those things. It was like fun, there's some fitness to it, and I could go wherever I wanted. So that's kind of how it started. And then when I figured out that if I bought a mountain bike, I could strap my luggage on there, and then I could just go traveling wherever I want and extend that range, that's then it, That's kind of how it kind of uh, transformed into using the bike to travel. Yeah. Wow. Nice. Well, uh, well I, I, I cannot not ask you how many countries have you traveled to already so far? Yeah, I'd have to. There was an app or, or there was a thing on Facebook years ago where you could kind of put the, a map, you know, I don't know if you remember that, and you could click all these places. But yeah, it must be 20 odd countries, I would imagine. Um, quite a few. I'll have to sit down and work them out. But a lot in Southeast Asia, obviously, initially, because that's where I was. Uh -huh. And I set up a travel company called Quick Release. And the idea was to take people that were based in Hong Kong um, for short breaks to within Asia. So there were mountain biking trips. I ran hiking trips, rafting trips. Um, and so it was kind of an excuse, really, for me to travel, if I'm honest, because I had to first scout the trip, the location, work out the itinerary, work out where we would stop for lunch, where we would sleep. And... Uh, and I can make some money while, you know, scratching the itch for travel, I suppose. So, yeah, it might, it's got to be over 20 countries, I'm sure, maybe more even. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, speaking of traveling now, uh, I, I've spent an hour or more uh, on your Instagram page. And uh, I must admit, you capture the most stunning travel photos I have ever seen. Uh, so just give us some some tips on how to be as unique as you are. And uh, and my, my very special question here, uh, when do you plan your own personal exhibition? Um, well, the second one is around time, really, because uh, I'd want to do it. I don't like doing things by half measure. So if I want to do something, I like to give it 100 percent. So and and having an exhibition would take quite a bit of time. Um, and that's something I don't have enough of right now. So, yeah, I'll do that in a couple of years, I imagine, um, when I have a little bit more time on my hands. It's something I could probably do even when I was retired, retired, if you call it that. Um, in terms of tips for, for photography, um, well, I suppose the first one is make sure you've got a camera with you. And it's now easy because it's on a phone, right? Um, years ago, when I first started, there were no camera phones, so you had to carry camera around with you which is a bit of a pain but um someone once said that the best camera is the one that you have with you which is very true right so i would say the main thing first thing to do is to just think about what it is you want to do what what you want from your photography because there's so many different genres and so many different things that you can do 
um, for me, it was initially just about recording where I was and what I'd done so I could, you know, revisit those memories later on. And then as I got more involved in the kind of creative process, it was more about telling stories. Um, sometimes it was about specific places or some concepts. Um, when I was living in Barcelona, it's very, it was very much affected actually by where you live. So when I was in Barcelona, it was predominantly city and street photography. And so I used to wander around either walking my dog or just in general. And sometimes I would just say, right, I'm going to look for um, uh, leading lines or I'm going to look for um, certain uh, composition types, maybe architectural or shadows, maybe. And then I would just be walking around thinking, OK, I'm going to take pictures in black and white and I'm looking for high contrast in shadows. Or maybe I want to um, concentrate on um, the difference between old and new. So sometimes I might just have a theme and it's a bit of fun, really. So I guess it's you've got to just try different things and, and figure out what you enjoy most. Some people I've got friends who focus on sport, 100 percent on sports photography. Um, and I have others that did photography just for uh, fashion, others that specialised in annual reports for companies. And so um, photographs that they would put inside annual reports. So, you know, there's so many different areas. You've just got to find the one that you enjoy. And I would say so to someone starting out, just experiment, really see what you enjoy the most and try lots of different styles. Yeah. Okay. Well, sp speaking of photos, speaking of uh, cycling and, and this, the, the active way of life you do, have you noticed uh, the announcements, uh, the announcement on Yammer? I uh, have. I have, have you? Indeed. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. The um, uh, distance, the distance for a difference. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we do have, I guess it's something that's built on the back of another initiative that we had where the leadership team um, came together. We created a group on Strava and um, we, we're using the features of Strava there to track our distance in terms of running. So we have a running group. Um, and I guess that's now extended into the distance for a difference um, events. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would encourage all the Symphonians to go and have a look at the Yammer post, read up, uh, read up on it and, and sign up. Yeah, and if you've got any questions, just yes. stick him in the post there. Yeah, it's exactly, and and actually join because uh, uh, what's very special about this particular initiative that every every kind of step, every every kilometer matters and does make a difference. So it doesn't matter if you are a professional runner or you are a professional sportsman, if, even if you do your two or three kilometers uh, uh, on that uh, on that matter, uh, that yeah. will make a difference as well right, okay, it all so. adds up, right mm -hmm. yeah even if you do like just 2k walking a dog just log it save it and stick it in exactly it will all sum up and we, and we will add it up and multiply and then uh it will uh become a generous donation so yeah let's let's just come together and make the difference right okay moving on uh, you started uh, this uh, first social uh, uh, community on Yammer when, when we launched Yammer at Infinite Solutions, and it was Food Lovers Band. Yeah, that's uh, right. So you obviously are, uh, uh, yeah. or you, you yeah. must be a food lover yourself. Well, uh, yeah, it's funny how all these things are connected. Right? So cycling makes me hungry. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, and I really do think that the type of food that you eat affects how you feel, right? So if you yes. eat junk, you kind of feel like junk. You may not even realize it, right? But if you eat healthy, you generally feel good. Um, and years ago, I was criticized really about cooking, saying, oh, Ed, you're a disaster at cooking. And probably I was, because I didn't really, I wasn't really cognizant of the importance of it. And for me, it was more a way of just not being hungry, okay, which is quite different. So. And I had two young girls that were at school and I thought, you know what, why don't I really figure out how to make them amazing pack lunches um, for their school? And it was really common in Spain back in, in those days where people would just get, you know, two slices of bread, some processed cheese, slam it in there, put in a slice of ham and throw it in a box and give it to the kids. And I thought, I'm never going to do that. So I started researching how can I make a set of really interesting meals so that my children look forward to lunch. And I wanted them to come back from school and ask what they're going to get for tomorrow. So those are my kind of KPIs, if you like. 
So I started really thinking about it. So instead of like buying like processed, you know, chicken wedges, I would buy proper chicken, marinate it, um, grill it, and then use that chicken to make sandwiches, for example. So you go kind of an extra step. I choose really nice, fresh, healthy ingredients, good bread, because every sandwich starts with a good piece of bread, right? Um, and just really put some effort into it. And after a while, you start learning different tips and tricks and things along the way. And I remember after a couple of weeks, my, my daughter said, Papa, man, everybody wants to see what we're having for lunch now. So, okay, <laughs> Houston, we have liftoff, okay. And, and I got really interested in it. I used to go to the markets in, in Barcelona, and I've got some amazing markets there. Um, and I used to really soak in the whole vibe. You know, you'd, you'd be seeing what other people are, uh, are picking. You would see the seasons, the different types of fruit and vegetables on offer. Um, and I start creating recipes by looking at what there was. I'd say, wow, those mushrooms look amazing. What can I make with mushrooms? I could do a risotto maybe or you know, whatever, right? So, um, and then they have these big communities. So you have areas where you can buy Asian products and Asian herbs and spices. So I kind of fell down that rabbit hole and started learning out how to make different types of Thai curries and Ind Indonesian food. Um, and it's one of those things, once you start putting yourself into a certain environment, it kind of shapes you, doesn't it, right? So once you get involved in a certain community, if, if you're interested in food, for example, and you surround yourselves with those people and you start reading more about that, it kind of perpetuates, right? You end up learning more, sharing more, uh, and then ultimately being a better, a better cook, I think. So, yeah, and so I thought, well, Yama, it's all about communities. I'm definitely the only person that likes preparing food and, and eating food, so why not create the community and, and get the ball rolling? And that's why I did. Yeah. Uh, here's another question from Mr. Cannabis. Uh, it says you are vegan. Is the dog vegan too? No, I'm not <laughs> vegan. I'm not vegan. I, I do love vegan food. Oh, okay. Um, but for me, it's um, I, will, I, will, I can have like a vegan breakfast and then I can have a steak lunch. All right. Sorry vegans but um for me vegan food is just it's like as if i was having thai food or an indian you know um i it's it's a label that we give it but yeah i eat vegan food quite often because i enjoy it um but i'd also enjoy having a lovely piece of salmon as well so yeah how, how my is dog, that my dog's definitely not vegan yeah it does eat vegetables or she does uh -huh. what, what's her name like her nice okay. yeah yeah. Is she is she somewhere around? She's downstairs actually. We're um, uh, house sitting another friend's dog, a golden retriever. So they're both downstairs. Yeah. All right. So uh, moving on, uh, we, we heard uh, that you wrote a book, but lost it. What actually happened? And are there any plans to rewrite it in the future? And what's yeah. the story behind all this? Well, actually, um, yeah, I, so I started writing a book. It's, it was, it's about traveling and cooking. Um, and it must mm. be about 10 years ago, I guess. And back then I was using a PC. The PC got infected by uh, a virus. And it basically just wiped out. I lost everything. I tried to get it back. But yeah, the, the book was gone. So um, I cried for a few days. And then I figured out, you know what? Uh, it's good. It was a good exercise. And I committed to writing that book in the future. So I'll do it again. It's on hold. Let's put it like that. Okay. Um, so I still it's in the, in the backlog. Yeah, it's in the backlog. It actually grew into three books. So I decided to make like a trilogy that kind of linked them together. Um, it's bad luck to tell you what it's all about. So I'm not going to share it. But when it comes out, I'll let you know. Well, that will be another, uh, there will be some food for our book lovers, Ben. Well, indeed, yeah, it's it it'll it will work with both bands because it combines actually travel with food um, together. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well, speaking of books, obviously, can you share your uh, favorite or most powerful books you have ever read? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, yeah, it's a really tricky one. Favorite books I've ever read. Wow. The ones that I remember are actually travel books. I used to read a lot of Lonely Planets. Um, uh, those are the ones that I read a great deal of when I was first getting into traveling. Um, I read a really interesting book um, by um, an old, I think it's the first celebrity cook, right? He used to cook for the Pope. The Pope. 
um, and the book was translated from Italian. Um, it's from the Middle Ages, and it, how, it holds a guide of really how to prepare your kitchen um, and lists of all these uh, kind of medieval recipes. So, yeah, he was a, that was a really interesting one. And obviously, what they eat now is completely different. In those days, tomatoes were just given to animals. Uh, yeah, you, humans wouldn't consider eating tomatoes, but that's a pretty interesting book. Um, I will uh, have to look up the uh, the full name of it. I can share it with you later, and you can maybe stick it on the Yama band, but that, that's a really interesting one. Not sure if I've got it behind. Oh, I do. How about that? Here we go. I don't know if you can see that. If you bring it closer to the camera, I guess, or if you just take your background up. No, well, it's, it's, background, but it's it's called uh -huh. the opera of Bartolomeo Scappi. And it was written in 1570. So, wow. yeah. So it's a pretty heavy book um, in terms of weight, <laughs> but it's definitely a, a very interesting read to anybody that enjoys a bit of history and, and cooking and, and that sort of thing. And obviously it's uh -huh. an insight into Italian culture in in you know the 15 uh, from 1570 so pretty cool nice okay uh please uh don't forget to share uh the name of the book on yammer uh, somewhere yeah. in the comments okay um so uh one of the last questions here uh uh you are living now on the beautiful island of Gran Canaria we all know it uh, or some those of you who don't know uh now you do uh what's this one unique aspect of the island's culture uh that has made a lasting impression on you and your digital nomad lifestyle oh wow um i would say that um, it's for an island it's actually very diverse in terms of uh, ge geography and also climate something i didn't really expect so you can travel 10 15 kilometers and the temperature can be 15 degrees different you can it can be raining and windy in one place and it can be absolutely gorgeous still sunny day not far away if you head into the north you have very big green um areas um, lots of foliage if you go to the south you can have deserts cactus and obviously if you go into the mountains you have beautiful mountain scenery with pine trees um lakes and that sort of stuff so um yeah diversity in terms of the landscape is certainly one thing i'll give you a few though the other is um i would say the influence um from uh, different cultures that you have here so we have a lot of people that are already living here obviously you have um europeans that come and make it home either part-time through the year or full-time so you have a lot of swedes germans uh, and dutch so you have those communities there you also have the english then you have the locals. I'm in a much more local um, coastal village. So you can really pick and choose. If you want to do the touristy thing, you can go into the more touristy areas. Um, if you want more local, you can choose the local. If you want to go to the capital, to Las Palmas, and live a kind of more city vibe, um, although you've got beaches uh, up there, then, then you can do that. And the infrastructure is amazing. So, you know, uh, 5G is on most parts of the island already now. Um, and the internet packages are cheap and it really stable, really good. So if you're working remotely, it's pretty easy, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, obviously, once again, lots, lots of different properties to rent as well. So if you if you are a digital nomad, it's not expensive. Yeah. Uh -huh. So once again, uh, plans for the future. Speaking of plans for the future, is that where you are going to stay for? Uh, the rest of your life or is there any other place on earth you want to travel to no i've got tons of other places i want to travel to but i think this will be my base let me put it this way i threw away all of the moving boxes so i don't plan to move again um so this will be definitely the base but yeah there's loads of places that uh, my wife and i still want to travel to before covid actually we were planning to buy um, a really big camper van um, have Wi-Fi in it, um, a satellite connection, and work from the van and just go traveling. And then COVID came along, um, and obviously travel wasn't po you know, possible, so we had to put that on hold. But certainly it's something that we will still do in the future. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gents, dear Symphonians, and all of you guys watching us, uh, uh, 
I am excited to announce that uh, Eduardo agreed to answer uh, all of your questions. You can ask those in comments, and I see you have been asking such already. And uh, whoever asks the most interesting or tricky or exciting question wins a really cool prize from Eduardo. Uh, Eduardo will announce what it is uh, after you ask all of your questions. Um, so speaking of questions, uh, we have quite a few and I must admit that we have people from all over the world. Um, Amsterdam, we have Nigeria, of course. So, uh, oh, he, he, here's the question from Shirley. I know that Eduardo is a food lover, so I bet he's actively celebrating today's national all you want eat day. I am really curious. What is his favorite junk food? Ah, oh, okay. So it so today is a national all you want to eat day. What is your favorite junk food? That's the question from Shirley. Hey, thanks for the question, Shirley. <clears throat> Honestly, I I don't eat a great deal of junk food, but my go-to if we can include ice cream in there, it'd have to be ice cream. Okay. <laughs> What's your yeah. favorite? Oh, we had this one. It's like salted caramel or something. It's delicious. Really good. When, whenever you whenever you visit us here in the view, we have a beautiful uh, uh, this uh, kind of like an ice cream shop, and they have over fifty uh, number uh, over fifty uh, kinds of ice cream, and they yeah. also also have kind of like a salmon ice cream. Salmon. Well, that's pretty yes. Good. I'll try yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Shirley. Uh, uh, well, great question. Um, so uh, here's another one. Shirley's sure, got you thinking of food now. Yeah. <laughs> this one, <laughs> this one, th this next question is from Andrei uh, Ivashchenko. Have you been a part of a local island digital nomad community? Do they have Instagram? If yes. They, so I'm not a member of one, but there are um, quite a few around, actually. And, and one of my friends that um, I met in Barcelona is a member of such a group. Um, she travels a lot. And um, she, yeah, I can I can try and find a link and share it uh, with you. But there are numerous ones, I think, in, in Gran Canaria and also in Tenerife as well. OK. Uh, so, Andre, thank you for this question. And uh, uh, all of you guys, make sure you follow uh, uh, Eduardo on Instagram. Or at least check his Instagram. The photos are amazing. I swear to God. Here's another question uh, from Coyote. My mama used to make good meals too. And all my classmates always wanted a bite. Well, it's it's not even a question. It's just a comment yeah. to, what, to what you've shared about you and your girls. Thank you, Coyote. Um, here's a question from Sanya Cobran. I love the light that your wife has for reading. She oh. said it, it was a gift from you. I purchased some for my daughter. Cool. Okay. What's the question then? <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's um, I don't think it's a question, but yeah, they are pretty funky. I remember Ksenia commented on the on the on the photo. Uh -huh. so basically there's, I don't know if you've seen them, it's like a, um, a flexible LED light that you can put around your neck and then allows you just to read a book without oh, so. the light, right? It's a pretty cool thing, actually. So so it's an, another uh, nomad, nomad, nomad uh, uh, fancy thing. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely use it. Uh, well, you could use it at home, wherever you are, I guess, or in a hotel room or, or whatever. Uh, well, uh, here's another comment from Kyoto. It's really sweet. Thanks for going all out for the kids uh you're the man of the year well, i do agree i do agree with that one hey, you're welcome cheers uh and here's a question from alessia <laughs> do you like to have guests over we do yeah I, I love it actually we we have tons of guests alessia you're always welcome um we have lots of people coming through i've got my niece coming in a couple of weeks um so it's always fun. We've got kind of a um, a package of different things that we can do for guests if they like 
city stuff we've got some ideas where we can take people into the city or if they're more into the water we take them snorkeling so yeah get, having guests it, it's good you know you can share what you know about the island and, and just see them enjoy themselves it's pretty rewarding i would say here's a very interesting question uh from andy uh ed any plans to travel to nigeria soon oh i've I been think, talking I, about it i think i think you should come try some meal soup okay. in aqua ibom nigeria Sounds you awesome. would likely not leave nigeria afterwards well, okay, I'll, consider that, I'll consider that an invite then so yeah i would love to i've talked about it a few times actually with leadership we've been talking about going out there so um yeah I, i think it's just a question of finding the right slot to do that but i would love to and i would love to take up on his offer of uh, trying the soup did you say it was Uh, it, it's a soup uh, somewhere in Aqua Ibom. Aqua, all right, cool. Yeah, I'm up for that. I'll eat anything. Yeah, so no problem. In, okay. in it, we say that if the the animal's back faces the sky, then you can eat it. Uh huh. Right, so I've uh, got a lot of different things. <laughs> Alessia says he wants some. She wants some ice cream now. Uh, uh -huh. So do I. Uh, here's a question from Avelina. Uh, how are you so relaxed and have you always been like that what's the recipe <laughs> that's a, that's about work life balance work life yeah. harmony probably Maybe. well i don't know i, I guess I, in terms of work life balance i've always made that a point yeah to make sure that i keep that balance in check because i've had parts of my life when it's absolutely not been in check and i've just worked and done no exercise yeah which is bad and then i addressed that balance a few years ago and so it's a conscious thing so making sure that i dedicate some time to to exercise you know um that's something that i'm conscious of and and so i i do in terms of being relaxed i think that's just my character oh i can just thank my parents for that one maybe uh-huh <laughs> so the recipe is uh, uh the genetics and and some exercising okay yeah uh here's a wonderful question from yuri uh eduardo by any chance do you also use or would like to use film camera not a digital wow uh, yeah it's really interesting i actually started out with film so that's in my school in, in hong kong we had a photography club so we learned how to um take photos and also how to process black and white film so i kind of grew up with that um there's still something really um magical about um a film based camera and the digital camera that i still have which is around here somewhere um it's a fuji film it actually looks like a very traditional film based camera so it has manual controls it's not all digital buttons and i prefer that experience so i like to be able to set my film speed iso um and have a manual focus and that sort of thing so it's the closest probably to to working with a um, a pre-digital camera i would say but i also love digital as well i like the fact that you can compose a shot take it and instantly see more or less how it is mm -hmm. where as opposed to with film where back in the day i'd have to wait you know four or five days to get your film back you know if you've just mentioned a photography club that's another idea for creating a band on yammer that's a great idea yeah it's a good <laughs> tanya if you're watching us just pick it up yeah okay. yeah cool. okay uh here's another question from kenneth uh i particularly enjoyed uh, your story or uh transition into the i-gaming industry as an enthusiast in the i-gaming industry what will be your advice and how will i get to being a vp in the sector just like you well so it depends where what you're doing but i would say the main thing is to um to think about the things that you enjoy doing first and kind of follow those so if you enjoy technology then follow that technology if you enjoy managing people then you know try and build on that and you can't really predict exactly where you're going to be but so, but break it into small pieces and find out the things that you think you might have some flair for things that you enjoy so for me i enjoy this actually i enjoy talking to people um and, and i enjoy sharing experiences with people and ultimately i like seeing people do well 
So that's quite good as a manager, right? If you, if you can give people the context for them to be awesome, you know, if that happens as a manager, you, I feel stoked. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, so I think it's important to find the things that you're good at, the things that um, you aspire to do, and then just join those dots as you go along. And if all goes well and you, and you learn and develop, you'll end up as a VP or a CEO. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll come naturally if you kind of keep focusing on, on building and developing yourself and, and, and ask questions, you know. Um, my dad always said to me, whenever you don't understand something, ask. Now, obviously, now we've got, you know, chat GPT and we've got Google, but use those things. And, and, and yeah, I think that's probably the best advice I could give is to just simply ask. Very nice. Thank you. Yes. Uh, here's another question from Kenneth. How many languages can you speak? Well, obviously, English is, is not too bad. Um, I've been learning Spanish since I've been here. Um, it's not very advanced. Have you? Have yeah. you learned one? Oh, I can get by. I can get myself arrested, probably. Um, <laughs> I can order food. You know, I can get myself out of trouble. I can order parts for my bike. Um I grew up in, in, in Hong Kong, so I grew up um, speaking English predominantly, but then I picked up Cantonese kind of through osmosis from hanging out with local Cantonese speaking kids. So it's pretty rusty now because um, I've not lived there for so long and not had a chance to experience. So um, a little bit of Spanish, probably Cantonese would come back pretty quickly, I would imagine. Yeah. And obviously English. And um, we studied French at school, but I can't remember hardly any of it. And we even did German, but yeah, I don't remember any of that either. <laughs> <laughs> well so, so you've learned what five languages and you you can speak two yeah okay uh, i think that answers uh, the question uh, at least and here's this last question from the audience uh that one's from from diana do you uh, how do you manage to be a great dad husband and great professional at work what a sweet question thank you diana <laughs> that's really lovely um well, the dad part's a little easier because my my kids are grown up, so they've flown the proverbial nest. They're doing their own things now. So um, I'm not involved, let's call it operationally day to day as a dad anymore. Um, I think um, if I were thinking about how that was previously, it's about really just being just caring about what they do and what they believe in. Right. That's, you know, ultimately you want your kids to be happy. And if your kids are happy and they're doing whatever it is that that. Um, provides them with joy and safety and security, then as a parent, then you'll be happy, right? Um, in terms of work, you just do the very best you can, I think. And I think you can probably apply that to almost anything. Again, I can thank my dad. He just said, whatever it is, give it, you know, give it 100%. If you, if you don't make it, well, at least you've given it 100%, right? Yes. Um, and I suppose just being mindful of those things. So if you're mindful of work, if you wake up each day and say, how can I get through this day and do something awesome, right? How can I do that? Um, then hopefully along the way, you'll, you'll manage to fulfill that goal, right? You can do that with whatever it is. So if you're interacting with your kids, how can I make sure that at the end of the day, your kids got something out of it? They thought, well, that was a good day. Mm. Right? So part of it is just being mindful of whatever it is you're trying to do, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, how do you manage to be, uh, well, it says a great husband. I don't know about that. Well, right. you have to ask my wife, yeah. <laughs> that would be have to ask her. I, I mean, it's like anything in relationships about communication first, right? Mm -hmm. Without turning into some sort of, you know, um, like one of those agony art things. But if you communicate well and you share what's going well, it's a bit like work, isn't it, right? If you share what works, what isn't, what's maybe hampering you, um, that's the first step to overcoming any challenges you might have. So just like at work, same thing happens at home. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, th this, well, we have two questions. Those will be uh, uh, just for the very end. Uh, a question from, uh, from Kenneth. Do you mentor? If yes, can I be your student? Whoa. Well, of course you can. Of course you can. Um, so mentoring is part of what I do anyway so we we have people that have joined the team at Symphony more recently whether that's so if they've come into a new role one that falls under the umbrella of of my area then of course I'm mentoring them and helping them 
um, if somebody uh, wants that and perhaps is doing a different role, then just reach out to me and yeah, I'm happy to, uh, I can't promise how much time I have because I'm pretty busy, but I can try and carve out some time, um, at least perhaps provide some guidance and shape you, uh, sorry, advise you in, in whichever shape or form you might need. So yeah, absolutely. Well, yes. Uh, well, uh, as long as we have launched the mentoring program at Symphony Solutions already, uh, I think all you have to do is just to go talk to your people partner or uh, just reach out to Eduardo directly and uh, 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 set some calls. And uh, well, at least you have an okay from Eduardo already, can it? Yeah. Hey, uh, Last question from Kostiantin Komarov. Eduardo, what is the most difficult in sales? Most difficult? Uh, in terms of the sales process? What's the most difficult in sales? That's the question. Uh, usually, I would say probably closing the sale, usually. Dealing with objections and closing is, is mo mo the most challenging thing. Yeah, those are definitely. All right. Well, easy to uh, start the talk. Then you, at some point, you need to close it. Okay, so yeah. now you 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 need to close it. Uh, who gets the prize? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be win win, right? So, if the person that you're you're selling to feels like they've won something, yeah, uh -huh. that's always a good way to do it. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I mean, you promised a prize for the most interesting or exciting question. So oh, who I gets the, who gets the prize? Jeez, that's a good question. Um, yeah. So we have Kasia uh, about sales, Kenneth uh, about mentoring program, uh, Diana about you being a great dad, husband, and a professional. Um, languages again from Kenneth. Another question from Kenneth about uh, your transition into uh, a gaming industry. A beautiful question from Yuri about the uh, cameras. Um, question from Avelina: How to be so relaxed? Um, uh, an invitation or, or a question about visiting Nigeria from Andy. Yeah. Hey. There was one about travel, right? The, 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 the most unusual travel place or something? Who was that? Was that uh, you? That was, that was mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was the one that I really remembered because you really brought me back to that point. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess um, maybe the sales one is quite an interesting one, right? Okay. So... Yeah, I'd probably go with either that one. Yeah, let's go with the sales one. It's quite interesting because it's relevant to work, of course, as well. Mm -hmm. So it's an in, it's an area where there's no um, uh, black and white answer to it, but it's quite an interesting topic. So I would actually like to talk about that one a little bit. Okay, yeah. then, then congratulations, Konstantin Komarov. You get the prize. What is the prize then? Well, I can't even remember what we agreed, to be honest. Um, <laughs> honestly, can't just, come up, just come up with anything. Um, well, how about um, how do I develop my career? What do I do to get from where I am now to being like a VP? I can perhaps help and expand a little bit more on that. So developing, um, growing as an individual, I'd be happy to share, you know, an hour or two there to talk to anybody who wants to think about their career development. And perhaps I can pass on some advice that I've picked up along the, along the so way. Would it be a private uh, conversation between you and Christian Din? I could be, yeah. Oh, for constant, yeah. No, we'll do it as a one-to-one. -one. Okay. Sure. All yeah. right. Um, uh, you will talk about personal growth uh, and yeah, sure. uh, whichever other questions uh, uh, you have. Uh, cool. There you go. How That's about, a win. How about this? Let's flip it. I can give him three options. We can talk about the career. If he wants to talk about the topic of being a digital nomad, he can have that. So I'm going to give him a menu, right? So digital nomad, what do I need to do? Consider, uh, et cetera the career development and how do I get from where I am now to being whatever it is he wants to do. And the third one, maybe about um, food and cooking about that. So All right. Great. I mean, that works for me. Let's see if that works for you guys. Okay. Uh, yeah. The very last questions question we always ask our guests is what advice would you give to your 18 year old self? Oh, I, I probably would not have gone to China after that I, argument with my girlfriend. <laughs> and not get arrested. Huh? Yeah, I would avoid that one. Yeah, I mean, the meatloaf, I could have just taken her out for dinner and gone to meatloaf and saved myself a whole load of misery. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, this is it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank all of you guys watching us on YouTube. Thank, thank you, you yeah. very much, Eduardo. I appreciate you being here. This was a blast. Uh, I mean, I had such a wonderful uh, whole hour of my life talking to you, chatting to you. And uh, uh, once again, just a quick reminder to all of us uh, together, uh, join the Distance for a Difference uh, challenge. Uh, uh, it's going to be in June. Check it on uh, Yammer. Invite your friends. Uh, get prepared. Get ready. Get trained. Uh, now, join our Book Lovers Club. We've talked about it a lot. Uh, join our Food Lovers uh, Band. Uh, we, we've talked about food a lot on this talk show. And uh, we've talked about growth. I wish all of us to grow bigger and to become happier day by day. Uh, this was Symphony Persona Live. We had a wonderful guest, uh, Eduardo Remedias. Thank you very much for being with us, Eduardo. Welcome. Have a good one, everybody. Enjoy the Cheers. rest of the day.